And so we want to start off our time together. We have a lot of material to go through, but we want to, I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna start off with a video. Um, and uh, this video um, um, is, is it was something that we found on the internet we thought was very, very interesting and can sort of set the stage for where we want to begin but it's not exactly where we want to end. And so, but there are some good parts to it. So just bear with me uh, while I share my screen. You... How do Africans kiss? How do Africans kiss? I don't know. I don't really see Africans kiss. I don't think Africans kiss really. Now that I think about it. How do they kiss? I don't think I've seen one, well, a couple kiss before, or a couple of Africans kiss before. So it's a little hard to answer that question. I think for me, Africans kiss secretly. No, I'm not. I'm not comfortable watching them kiss. And I think that is probably attributed to the environment in which I was raised. Black people kissing in general is not weird to me, but specifically when I watch, for example, Nigerian films and I see Nigerian people kissing, I'm always like, hmm, that doesn't quite, I don't know, something weird about that. <laughs> I don't know why, but it just is. How do Africans kiss? Um, compared to Europeans, very badly. Um, to be honest, uh, because um, it's not, kissing is not part of uh, African culture. It's a uh, European culture and we did borrow some stuff to complete our love. But honestly, we are bad kissers. How do Africans kiss? Uh, uh, I wouldn't say passionately. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we kiss, um, uh, I think, uh, hmm. I think <laughs> it all depends on the exposure, on outside exposure, where you live, how you're brought up and everything. Uh, in the rural areas, I didn't see any kissing going on. I haven't seen, I haven't experienced it. In the city, parties and stuff like that, we see kissing pretty, some, to somewhat uh, similar. But in general, um, we, are, we held our emotions and we don't express it as much as it needs to be expressed. Okay. With the younger generation. All right. All right. We'll stop there for now. Um, and so uh, we wanted to use that as an introduction to the class, of course, learning and growing to live as one. Uh, and again, we're excited to be able to be here with you. Uh, we've been married for 23 years and um, um it's been a fantastic uh, um, being married to the woman I'm sitting next to. And, you know, our, I've been a minister for 23 years. And in those 23 years, I have officiated 27 weddings. And I'm going to do my 28th wedding uh, in October. What's interesting about this video um, is, you know, the couple at the end. And what they talked about was this idea of how we express ourselves romantically um, or sexually depends on really where we're from, whether we're from the rural areas or we're from the city, whether we're from um, African culture or another culture. But it's said here in the video that African culture doesn't express our emo uh, emotions as much. So I don't know if you th believe that that's true. You can write that in the chat if, if you believe that. You can say yes, no, maybe. <laughs> um, but the question that we wanna try to address today is what does it mean for sexual intimacy for Africans? Is it possible or really for anyone? Yeah, the, I thought it was interesting how one of the women in the video, she said, um, who the one who was not comfortable with kissing said it had to do with the environment in which she was raised. And, and the other man said that kissing is European culture. So, you know, those are 
questions like, is that true? Does it matter? I know the main thing though, as Christians that we do need to sort out is what part of what I understand about sex and sexual intimacy is my culture and what part is the Bible? Um, what does God expect and what does my culture expect? Because we do know that uh, sexual expression is very cultural and we will see differences uh, around the world and over time. So sometimes God and culture will be in alignment and, and sometimes they will clash. We know that in many other areas in our life. And it's also true with our sexual intimacy. But there's hope. There's, there are biblical principles that are always true and always relevant, no matter what culture or time in history that you live. And we hope to draw these out for you today. Um, we come to you today not to try to make you more American uh, or to make you more African, for that matter, um, in marriage, but for your marriage and your sexual relationship uh, in marriage to be more godly. That is really the key. You know, how you choose to express uh, these principles, God's principles of sex in your marriage is entirely up to mm -hmm. you. And we're hoping that this will be a starting point for some very, very good discussions uh, between spouses um, and in your small groups um, of married people to really come to a place where we're helping each other be more biblical in the way that we carry out our marriage. And so we're excited to, uh, to, to share what we've learned about how to honor God in our sexual relationship. We're going to begin today in Genesis chapter 2. And in the 27 weddings that I've done, I've, I think I've read this passage just about every single time. I absolutely love this passage. Genesis chapter 2 verse 19. Now the Lord had formed out of the ground all the, an the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the, in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of man, and he brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called, whoa, man, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. In the feedback we received from you, you want us to address how important, how important is the sexual relationship or sexual intimacy in marriage. I will say that it's extremely important. This passage begins to teach us why. In verse 24, it says, you are commanded uh, to be one flesh um, as the married couple. Now, in the New Testament, we know that in the church, we're commanded to be one, to be a one mind. But you're not commanded to be one flesh with anyone else except your wife. And so it's a unique relationship. Uh, in verse 21, when God created man he, and woman, he also created sex. This is all part of the beginning of creation. And this shows us how important that it is. It didn't come later on uh, and, and uh, because God had forgotten. Mm -hmm. He under this was an, an integral part of his creation, a creative process. In verse 25, you know, the Bible says that what he created was good, which includes sex, which includes marriage. And the goodness of it is to be free of shame. No guilt, no insecurity, free of shame. Now, according to God, sex is good. Sex is not shameful. Shame entered into the sexual relationship because of sin. And you can read in Genesis chapter 3 in the fall of man when the relationship between men and women became strained and we can think of our own lives and we can think about, about the shame about sex that's connected to sin and the shame as the shame enters how it puts a strain on our marriage at times so here's a good question for the chat you you can write it in um and so the question is is so how did you feel when 
uh, feel knowing that we were going to talk about sex today? How did you feel? I felt happy, mad, sad, glad, nervous. You know, we all can have hangups and sensitivities for various reasons. The challenge for each and every one of us, though, as Christians, is that our comfort level or culture shouldn't dictate what we believe about what is pure, what is right, what is lo lovely, um, what is good in God's sight. And sex and becoming one flesh is exactly that in God's sight. Yes, uh, lots of feelings can come up about this topic. I mean, for me, the first time um, I, we, we did this lesson in Virginia, William mentioned that, I was not looking forward to that. I just thought, oh man, this is a tough topic. It's so vulnerable. And then to know that, to be asked to do it again, <laughs> In South for, for, for South Africa. I just thought, oh my goodness, this is going to be challenging. At the same time, I'm excited about it because I think it's a great topic, especially when you look at Genesis. So I have mixed feelings, to be honest with you. It's very vulnerable, but uh, at the same time, what an amazing topic from God's point of view. Now, I have a, uh, my dad is from Malawi, so he immigrated to the United States and met my mom in graduate school. And I also lived half of my childhood in Harare, Zimbabwe. So I have a mixture of cultures in terms of what I've seen in romance and, and uh, sexual intimacy. So I have an African dad, American mom, and so I, I actually didn't see a lot of um, public displays of affection, as they're called, PDAs, uh, in my family, um, between my mom and my dad. Um, it was just very um, secretive, like it was just not something that was present in the household. And so, you know, think about that for yourself. Like, what did you see growing up and how does that influence how you think about sex today? And before we continue, I just wanted to clarify some terms that we use uh, back and forth. Sometimes we interchange them. Sometimes we say sex. Sometimes we say intimacy. Um, but they're actually different words, at least for the sake of this lesson. Um, sex really is the shortcut for the act of intercourse, what we do to give each other physical pleasure. It can include orgasm, but doesn't have to, includes thing, you know, sexual pleasure leading up to it and after even. Um, so sex can happen without intimacy. So what is intimacy then? I know there was a question that you sent to us what is real intimacy versus satisfying intimacy, godly intimacy versus the intimacy in the world? And so we're just going to address that for a little bit. If you look in Genesis 4.1, maybe make a note of that and go back to that later. It says that Adam knew Eve. That's the King James translation. Um, in the newer translations, it says he made love to Eve. Now that Hebrew word is actually a word called yada, and it is a very special word. It's so deep. It's also used in talking about knowing about God, yada. It's this closeness that's a result of a deep sharing and knowing and vulnerability, really nakedness. This yada, when Adam yada Eve required him to reveal himself in a, in a way that he wouldn't reveal himself with anyone else. Remember it said, uh, Floyd read, that they were naked but had no shame. So there's two types of intimacy that uh, are that come to play in the sexual relationship. The emotional in intimacy, and I, I heard you 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 had a workshop with Florence and Jeff Sackinger. They're great friends of ours, and they actually mentored our marriage. And we're going to talk about them a little bit later. So there's the emotional intimacy, which is that knowing the yada at the deepest emotional level, being emotionally honest, and then sexual intimacy, which is what we're talking about today knowing each other sexually, what gives you pleasure, what gives me pleasure, like knowing what our, our spouse's uh, pleasure centers and uh, are, and also for ourselves. So becoming one flesh is not just about sex itself. It's about both the physical pleasure and knowing each other sexually on a deeper level. And the thing is, it takes a lifetime to, to get this because the context keeps changing because, you know, there's becoming, there's learning to live as one on your wedding night, right? Which is different from learning to live as one after a fight or with kids or after a loss. Learning to live as one when you're stressed is different than learning to live as one on vacation or when we age or right now we're in a global pandemic. 
So anyway, I just want you to focus on the big picture today, the environment that we're creating in marriage that makes great sex possible. We're not sex experts, but we're going to share the best we can from the scriptures and from our life uh, life story. And I want you to think about it. We want you to think about it like uh, an analogy of a cake. Imagine your sexual relationship as a cake. So we could spend time describing the cake, like the outside of it, the type of frosting, you know, whether it has layers or not. But we could also talk about the ingredients that go into the cake, what you don't see, the eggs, the milk, the things that are maybe not as sexy, but we wouldn't have a cake without them. So we want to share from our experience about the ingredients that make a great love story, the things that couples are, have in their lives that make great sex and intimacy uh, work in their lives, especially when no one is looking. All right, fantastic. You know, every couple has a love story. And so becoming one flesh isn't just about sex. It's about unfolding your love story over time. As, 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 as when we get together with couples, one of the first things that we want to know is how did you become a couple? And it's always fascinating to hear the story unfold. And as we gain greater and greater intimacy and knowledge of each other, the story just becomes richer and more meaningful. And when people tell their story, their, their faces light up. They're, they get excited mm -hmm. about sharing their love story. But we have a choice about how to view love story from our own perspective or from God's perspective. We need to take the long view and not stress over what's happening right now. Um, it takes time to have to make a beautiful story. You know, our love story is fantastic. We, um, were, we both became Christians in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1993. And uh, we met each other then, but we weren't interested in each other. It's only about a, a year later, we went on a mission team to plant the church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And uh, a couple of years after that, we started working together, leading campus ministry. And that's when we discovered each other. And um, we've been best friends since that time. And our friendship continues to deepen. And that's through so many twists and turns and ups and downs and moving to five different cities mm -hmm. or six different cities. I can't remember. Um, and, and, you know, we, we've, we've looked to, 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 to others who are ahead of us to see where we want to go. We've learned so many great things from um, other couples on, in terms of writing our own story. And so the challenge is, is when we listen to some, someone's love story, it's, it's easy to compare. Mm. And, and sometimes we lose hope in that comparison. The goal here is not to compare your lives to us, but but to actually to inspire you. Sometimes we hear other stories to inspire us. Mm -hmm. And that's what we hope. And you know, sometimes it's just to know that you're normal, just to yes. know that <laughs> it's the struggles and the challenges that you face are, are yeah. not anything beyond the scope of human existence. And so we're going to tell our love story on becoming one flesh in its different seasons. There's a great passage in Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1. And then in verse 11, it says, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, mm. yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. There's a time for everything. We want to share how to become one flesh changes and has changed for us over time and what we've learned. We'll share about various seasons of a married couple's life. And I want to mention something that, that, that the prayer, praying together is so crucial to building intimacy. It's, it's a yes. powerful way uh, to build intimacy. You know, one of the things that we were told when we weren't married was, hey, avoid praying too much together. <laughs> and at first we didn't understand that. But when we asked more questions and when we've, we've, now we've been married for 23 years, prayer draws you together. And when we were single, we didn't want to be drawn together too quickly. But as a married couple, it's, it is absolutely an ingredient that should be to help you draw um, yeah. together and praying about everything, including your intimacy and your sex life. And we'll share a little bit about how our conviction on that grew over time because we weren't always where we're at today. And so we'll hope you find yourself um, in it and it'll spur you on to have some great discussion prayer to seek advice about your own relationship and, and most of all, we we'll hope that you feel normal. Um, we also hope that you feel inspired to go out there and continue making your own love story. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're, 
we're going to sort of base these love stories on seasons of married life. I, I've read some articles on, on this topic of seasons of married life. And it dawned on me that, 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 that as I was reading the, the, the articles, that this, this really affects our intimacy, the various seasons that we're in. And so if we're not aware of what those are, um, we, we won't know what to do to be able to make sure we continue to build that oneness in our marriage. And so uh, along the way, we want to use the Song of Songs. Of course, the Song of Songs is a collection um, of, of poems. It's actually not meant to, to be read chronologically from beginning to end. It has good things throughout it. But the Song of Songs is a, is a Hebrew idiom, uh, really meaning the greatest of all things, like the holy of holies, the, the inner place where the, in, the in, the, in, the, in the temple was the greatest place that you could be. And so this Song of Songs is the greatest of all songs. Mm -hmm. And guess what it's about? It's about intimacy, marriage, and the sexual relationship. And so there's a lot to learn there. All right, we're going to share my, our screen again. Um, because I want to uh, show you some slides along the way, uh, just to spur some things to inspire you, just to keep uh, you on uh, in, in terms of where we're at. So um, if you want to, there's a, usually a slider with three little lines. Uh, you can actually split the screen and uh, the, the um, oops, excuse me, let me stop sharing here. This is not where I want to start. All right, give me a moment here. All right. All right, let's try this one instead. All right, here we go. All right, can everyone see that? You can give a thumbs up. Can everyone see that? All right. The first season is the season of passion. The season of passion. In Song of Songs 3, verses 1 through and 2, it says, All night long on my bed, I looked for the one my heart loves. I will search for the one my heart loves. You know, when we read this particular passage, we hear about this intense longing for the other person. Mm. Longing to the point of searching for them, being consumed by your feelings for this, this other person. And this is good in marriage and honors God, passion. Now, what this is like is uh, this passion season is this intense desire. And this actually begins before you're married um, in the dating and the engagement. Of, but of course, you need to have good boundaries right there. But I remember uh, dating Tamara as a single man and just at the end of the night feeling like I, I want to still spend time with her. And it became progressively more difficult as our relationship progressed to to not want to spend time and uh, that told me that I think I need to get married to this person because I want to spend all my time with her and, and so after you get married you know you, you, you this passion manifests itself in sex everywhere <laughs> you have sex in the bedroom you have sex in the living room you have sex on the steps you have sex in the car. You have sex on the beach. You have sex in the shower. You just are passionate. You want to be together in the closest way that you possibly can. Yeah, this longing. I do remember that uh, season uh, from dating and to the wedding night and some time after that and thinking when we were dating, like, oh, I don't want to say goodnight. I thought I remember thinking that too. And the wedding night, having that confidence that Floyd desired me, that would just brought me so much security. And as a newlywed, I just remember being so adventurous, you know, being willing to try new things. Like you said, sex in different places. Of course, that works best if you live alone <laughs> without other people. But anyway, it was just, it is typically such romantic time. And it also has been that for us in the early years of our marriage. So the, there are challenges in this period of time that I think, again, we should be aware of. We weren't completely aware of these, but we were grateful that we had a couple who had mentored us uh, during this time. And we were able to see some of these things, uh, not of our own um, um, vision, but, uh, but others who were able to, we were able to invite into our relationship. This season has its limits. Uh, first of all, we both had sexual experiences with other people before 
coming to Christ. Mm. And so you carry those memories and those experiences with you. And there was a lot of fear um, about those images being becoming present or becoming so forward in our minds. And so what we had to do was pray for peace. And what was interesting is that Tamara and I both were praying, but we didn't tell each other we were praying because we were both uh, had the same um, concern. Mm. And, and so, um, you know, prayer helped just to be able to um, put us at a, a place of peace and train our minds to uh, think in a godly way and not be afraid of those experiencing ruining, um, mm. you know, what is uh, God is, is, has made good. The other thing that was interesting was just learning how vulnerable you are at this stage. You know, sometimes people reduce sex to just, it's just to make kids. Mm. But there is something spiritual and deep that happens in sex. Um, and the reason why I say that is that, you know, is that when, when, when people have sex, there's a connection that I think is formed that I think is not, a, not fully understood by people. Mm. In the Old Testament times, if you slept with a woman who was not not your your wife, um, you know you were put to death mm -hmm. if if you forced yourself upon her because there was something so significant about that sure. act. And so, for me, uh, um, I needed to learn how vulnerable Tamara was. Never had she let another man uh, see her in those ways. Um, to see her not just in a physical way, but also emotionally. And I'll never forget one night we had a family time and I had made dinner and we had a great discussion. And then um, Tamara went to the kitchen to uh, do the dishes. And I went upstairs to go read a magazine that I had always read. I I'd put it off for a few days. And after she was finished with the dishes, she came upstairs and um, she sat in the bed with me and wanted to read my magazine with me. And I was annoyed. I said, this is my time. This is my magazine time. I already gave you your time in dinner. And at Tamara went away crying and she was sad. And I just remember thinking, uh-oh, whatever I did, that was not good. A few days later, we were able to get together with a, a couple to talk about that little um, episode in our marriage. And I'll never forget the brother saying to me, he said, bro, the, the name of the magazine was Sports Illustrated. He said, bro, do you live, do you love Sports Illustrated more than you love your wife? And I was so convicted just hearing that question because I, I knew that the answer was no, I, mm -hmm. I love my wife more. But in reality, I was behaving very differently. I was behaving as if the magazine was the most important thing in my life. And what I failed to understand was that Tamara was seeking intimacy, not just sex, but she wanted to be close. She wanted to be in my world and in my space. And But because I was just focused on what I wanted, I wasn't able to see that. And what I needed to understand is that, again, she had never been that exposed and that vulnerable with another human being um, in her life. And that vulnerability um, needed to be um, taken care of. Mm -hmm. Yes, for me, was now that I look back on that state, that season of passion, I could see some of the challenges um, as well now, looking back. And one of the biggest challenges, really, in an odd way, is ignorance. I just did not know much about the sexual relationship. I didn't know much about my own body and sexual desire, who I am, what um, pleases me sexually. I didn't know what it really took for me to have an orgasm. I didn't have them often actually. And I also was coming into the sexual relationship with Floyd more passively, um, thinking it's really about Floyd's desire and um, not really thinking that this is also for me to have pleasure. And so uh, some of the ingredients, remember we talked about the ingredients that go into uh, this season, the se passion season, is that you must talk about your sex life. I just remember even talking one time at Pizza Hut, at, at, a, at a restaurant <laughs> called Pizza Hut um, on our honeymoon about our sexual relationship. It's very important to start praying together every day about everything, really, but including your sex life. And to start reading books about the basics, like understand the science, uh, just even how the brain is the, 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 the most important sex organ, or even understand anatomy. Like the clitoris, for example, is the only organ God has made with no other purpose than to have sexual pleasure in the woman. 
a great book for us at this stage was a book by Sam and Jerry Lang called Friends and Lovers, Marriage as God Designed It. And so again, in this stage, I, I think it, this is an early stage. Seek out great discipling, read books together um, about sex, communicate with each other by intentionally making space to talk about these things. We used to do it on a Monday night. We used to have regular family times and we would um, have just great talks. And that really was a great foundation for us because you know, throughout our 23 years, one of the things I remember the most is just our talks. We, we've had short talks, and, but we've had really long talks. And, and so um, in this passion stage, these are the things, these are the ingredients that are going to help you to be successful in keeping your oneness and helping your sexual intimacy be something that honors God. The next stage that I want to talk about is well, the stage that we call reality hits. <laughs> and so reality hits. All right. Can you see that slide? Okay. Reality hits. Song of Songs, chapter uh, 2, verse 15. Catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom. I don't know if any of you have ever planted a garden, but it takes a lot of work to plant a garden. And when your plants start coming up and start, you know, be maturing, there's a sense of pride and satisfaction. And, it, you know, but you also have to look out for uh, at different stages in planting a garden, different kinds of um, rodents or insects that can destroy your garden. Well, foxes can be one of those things. You know, foxes ruin gardens. Why? Because they dig holes. They dig up the roots. Um, they take away what has been given so much, uh, so many, so much nutrients. And there are things in our relationship that will uproot it if we're mm. not aware. There are dynamics and habits that will ruin um, the passion in our love story. So what is that like? You know, this is uh, for us, uh, uh, happens about three years into marriage. And this is where the euphoria of the honeymoon stage starts to die down and you settle into this life together, so to speak. And so, for, again, for us, it was around three years. Uh, this is when our first son was born. And it lasted for about 10, until about 10 years in the marriage. And the pervasive thing that would happen, we wouldn't say this to each other, but we thought this, everything would be great if you just changed. <laughs> everything would, you know, this marriage would be fantastic if you were just different. <laughs> and you begin to see the faults in your spouse, which is very normal. You live with someone every day and you see them in all different kinds of scenarios you know they don't put down the toilet seat they don't do the dishes when they say they're going to do the dishes they forget your favorite food when they go shopping they struggle spiritually and so sex can become um, much more infrequent because our emotional states our brains are upset are hurt are frustrated and so sex in some cases, this goes away entirely mm. uh, because we just, these things cause us not to feel connected to one another. In this, um, this season of reality yeah, hits, so I, uh, I learned that there are a lot of things that affect my sexual desire. Um, like, for example, after having our first child, the door not being locked, you know, when we're in our bedroom. Um, or if I'm cold, or if I need to go to the bathroom, or if I'm feeling down or stressed out. But most significantly, most significant was how I felt about our relationship, my relationship with Floyd. If I was happy in our relationship, or if I was feeling shut down or hurt, that would definitely put the brakes on my sexual desire. So during this phase of reality hits this season, I did start to feel emotionally distanced from Floyd. I mean, I still um, made decisions. I still chose to have sex, to have a sexual relationship because of a conviction that we needed it. But there were some serious things that were causing me to not, to lower my desire. And um, it was also during this phase, which kind of makes sense that we had a hard time staying committed to praying together. Um, you know, I wanted to do it, but um, 
maybe if I sensed that Floyd wasn't as interested, then I would stop asking. So there was just a lot of things like that happening. All right, very good. The number one thing that affected our love life during, from you know, from from my point of view, um, at during this stage was me. Tamara alluded to it. What would happen to me is that when I was hurt or confused, I, I became what you call a quick a cave dweller. I would pull into a cave and I would wouldn't speak to Tamara, and I would just internalize. Uh, my hurts and my pains. Excuse me, one moment. Let me just um, change our video here just to be a little bit more smooth. There we go. Um, to be a, a cave dweller, and um, that that really uh, hurt Tamara. I, I did not know how to get in touch with whatever it is that I was feeling in the moment, and it really affected us. Mm -hmm. So some ingredients for this season of reality hits that you would want to put into your marriage so that your sexual intimacy thrives. Um, one significant thing, at least for me, was moving from everything would be great if you changed to basically working on myself, not focused on trying to change him. Um, I really needed to understand my own spiritual and emotional inner world. Um, if I, be I realized if I became more like Jesus in my marriage, then it would be better even if he stayed the same. I had to really learn about my emotions, um, get in touch with even my past and childhood wounds to understand why I react the way that I did. Um, one of the books that helped me to understand myself and also Floyd is, you probably heard of this book, The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman, just to focus on what is it that um, pleases him um, and him focusing on what pleases me. All right, excellent. So for me, I needed to make a decision to put th push through the temptation to isolate by communicating, uh, by reaching out to brothers and setting a, and and then also setting a time frame to reconnect. I had to learn these skills, um, meaning that I had to learn how to say to Tamara, "Hun, I'm not ready to talk right now, but I'm going to talk to this brother. Let's talk tomorrow, or let's talk in two days, or let's talk in three days." and um, just to be able to find, give myself some space to figure out what I'm really feeling. And so expressing my feelings to godly men and to God gave me perspective and helped me not to brush my feelings under the carpet or opposite to give full vent to them at Tamara um, either. And so in this time, I, they would give me perspective and it would help me to learn to see the good and not just get so caught up in what I was upset about. Mm. Sometimes you can get upset about one thing and you no longer see the good in your spouse. It, uh, talking helped me to learn to praise the good and to forgive shortcomings. And it also set the stage for fighting through so that we could pray together even when uh, uh, we weren't fully resolved or I didn't feel like it at the, at the moment. And so uh, this particular stage, um, you know, reality uh, can be very, very shocking, but you can make it through. Let's move on to the third stage, which this stage is called cooperation. Cooperation. In Song of Songs 6-1, it says, Where has your beloved gone, most beautiful of women? Which way did your beloved turn that we may look for him with you? You know, at this point in the book, the couple, you know, um, they're to, they're to, they're together, but not fully together. They're a couple, but not fully together. And it's obvious from those looking on the outside that hey, they're there, but they're we need to figure out how to get them closer together. So in this season, we become busy with our lives. We become we 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 have children, perhaps, and children, as awesome as they are, divide your time. <laughs> The time that you would spend with your spouse is now focused on that child. Our careers uh, sometimes grow and, and, and our pursuits become um, more varied. And so one day we wake up and we're like, what we're, we're looking at each other is, where is my beloved? Who are we together? Where did our love go? And in this season, we need to learn how to be more than just roommates. Mm -hmm. We need to learn to be lovers again and learn to work as a team. Now, what this is like, this for us, this is about 10 years into our marriage until 
recently. So uh, pretty much the last 13 years or so. You know, the longer that we were married, the more complicated things became. And uh, um, uh, we moved houses, our careers, uh, we changed jobs, our personal, personal commitments grew deeper, our friendships individually grew, um, and then we had children. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I was mentioning, Tamar and I, even though we had that um, uh, uh, stage of reality hits, it wasn't actually that bad. It wasn't until we started having children that we had even more in, in, intense arguments. And, um, you know, but there are mortgages to be paid. You, there's so many things to do. Hmm. And sometimes you can even begin caring for your aging parents uh, during this time. And so life is progressing and expanding, but sex may not be. You may be just too tired emotionally or, or there's, it doesn't feel like there's enough time for it. And so you're trying to figure out how to manage this life together and it's ever expanding dimensions. And so the challenge here is that sometimes you become great teammates, great roommates, but it's at the, it's at, it's at the expense of being great lovers. Mm. The bedroom can become the boardroom where you just talk about the plans. What are the kids doing? What are we doing with our parents? What are we doing at work? And it just becomes more talk about our schedule and less talk about our sex and how we're doing in our intimacy. And so it can become routine and you live out of obligation towards one another and the passion no longer is quite as in the forefront. And so sex will become less exciting or can be, and it, become, it can become less frequent. And uh, there's so much uh, that's taking our mental and emotional energy, the kids, the job, the roles in our church, the hobbies, mm. that there's nothing left for each other. Yes, I remember this season as um, an exhilarating time in life in general, um, because, you know, you're more secure in yourself, you're pursuing some exciting things, you have growing responsibilities. But to be honest with you, for me, sex was one of the last things on my mind, and it really showed. You know, I wanted to be sexually intimate, I wanted to have sex, but I didn't notice, I wouldn't notice how much time would have passed since we last had sex. Like it, it just wouldn't occur to me that Floyd would say something. Um, it, 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 in this phase, it, it was a struggle for me to pay attention to Floyd, uh, especially sexually or emotionally. I struggled with even knowing what he wanted and what would make him happy. Also during this time, some body, some serious body image issues surfaced for me, like how I thought and felt about my own body, especially after our second son, I had some postpartum depression, I had a lot of fears and insecurities that were not in the earlier seasons of our marriage. Um, I think they were there, but they didn't manifest themselves until around this time. One of my biggest fears was that Floyd would no longer be interested in me sexually. He would no longer want me or desire me. And the root of it, when I realized after actually I did seek therapy, um, and the root of it, I realized I was just so unhappy with my own body, with myself, and I needed to address some things inside. So one of the books that really helped us, and in, in, in really this was the time that Jeff and Florence Sackinger were in our lives, was their book, Building Emotional Intimacy in Marriage. Um, that was an incredible gift to us that they mentored us. And I really, we really um, had this really, we had a wonderful opportunity to learn about emotional honesty um, uh, and how we didn't really talk to each other um, at a deep level. And so we, we, we began again talking every night in order to pay attention to what was going on in, inside of each other. We re recommitted to praying every day because we had stopped doing that. And uh, we we're able to increase our frequency of doing that. We actually had to schedule when we were going to have sex <laughs> to put it in a calendar, which wasn't happening in the in the passion stage. You didn't need to, but in this stage, we needed to. Yeah. And for me personally, I just had to really struggle and work hard to learn how to love the body that I have um, after two kids, how to appreciate it for what it's accomplished mm -hmm. and not just what it looks like. It was important also for me to have affection from Floyd that didn't lead to sex, that it was just uh, just affection just because that just communicated to me that he just liked being, liked me, liked my body and liked being together with me. All right, excellent. 
So as Savar alluded, we, we definitely needed, we learned how to intentionally build our intimacy. And so we ended up talking about what do we need to, what do we each need to create a great environment for sex? Um, you know, and, and so we talked about what arouses us. Uh, we had conversations about our sexual experiences. Um, we went out and I remember that was the time we started getting better sheets and, you know, <laughs> putting candles in our room and all these various things just to be able to create the right environment uh, around us. And we would talk and uh, about frequency. Um, you know, how, how are we doing? Are, are, we, are we in a good space? Because um, at different points in time, you, you the, the frequency will change based on how busy you are, and but also each each person's sexual desire can fluctuate um, throughout your marriage. Uh, sometimes it's the man who wants to have sex all the time, and then it might be the woman who wants to have sex all the time, and the man not so much. And so we need to talk about that and understand that that's normal, um, the, the change of frequency, but without the communication, that's where the little foxes get in there. Um, and and really um, um, make it very very challenging. I want to mention a word about pornography. You know, you can do almost anything as a couple. First um, Corinthians ten twenty three says everything is is uh, uh, permissible for me, as long as you agree. Uh, you can bring sexual toys into the bedroom. You know what you do in sex, um, whether it's just straight intercourse or oral sex or uh, what. Whatever you agree to do as a couple, you can do. <laughs> now, some have asked me, well, what about watching videos together? You know, what if, what if that helps our sexual intimacy? In Hebrews 13, 4, it says, Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Immoral. Here's the question I would, uh, here's how I would answer this, is that if you're bringing other human beings into the bedroom, even if it's through video, into a bond that's just meant for two, mm. does that honor God? Mm. So the answer is no. You, you don't bring other people into your bedroom, even if it's on a video. Mm. Let's move on to the next stage. We're going to speed up a little bit here just so that we can uh, hit the stage. But the next stage is what we call the reunion stage the reunion stage. And um, this uh, particular stage, let's read Song of Song 8, verse 6. Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death. It's jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. You know, here in this particular passage, the seal here is like a tattoo. Uh, a permanent mark imprinted on someone's body. And in this season, you've moved beyond passion to a deeper love that is still passionate, but much stronger, something that is much more permanent, something that is actually stronger than death. Mm. I want to take a moment here. We want to show you an, another video clip from the same set of interviews here. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and uh, let me... Get back to our video here. What time is it again? All right. 
You know, that video um, is um, intense. And, you know, um, I, I understand that uh, a lot of you went to a funeral today, so that may hit home very, very close. But this woman who buried her children, the, the way that she answers through such tragic loss is amazing. I feel strengthened by the love my husband has for me and by my faith in God. You know, and it's love that's going to overcome the obstacles. It's, it's love that fights to stick together. But, but it's got to be love that's not superficial. You're together with each other no matter what, even through great loss. So what that's like is, you know, we're approaching 23 years married, and we have one child left in the house. And uh, this is the stage you uh, enter after your kids leave or begin their own adult journey. And the good news in this stage is that all the, the pain and hard work of the earlier stages and the hard work you put in your marriage begins to really pay off. There's no longer a struggle to define who you are and what the marriage should be. There is more peace and harmony and you start seeing your spouse again. If you have children, uh, they're older and more independent, allowing you to focus on your marriage just like in the old days. However, this time you feel more secure. You have a great sense of who you are as a person and you begin to appreciate the differences between you and your spouse instead of trying to change each other. And you start having the old day feelings again. And you, in one sense, you come full circle. Mm. Now we're not quite there yet, mm. but what we can say is it's at this stage that we, we, we think that stage uh, sex can be at its best. Mm. Um, I've spoken to an older couple, um, um, Al and Gloria Baird, and, um, and he, you know, they wrote a book uh, called A Lifetime of Love. And in the book, they talk about how sex after the kids left is amazing. It's actually better because you know what you want. Mm -hmm. You really do know how to pleasure um, each other if you've had the conversations, if you've developed a habit of talking. And so, um, you know, we recently recommitted um, when a couple who was further ahead of us last summer told um, um, last summer that they do what they do right before bed. And what they do is they, they take turns just praying together. And it was all about having an unbroken relationship with God. And um, we really committed to that, recommitted to that last year. And it's been great. Um, and we do that fairly consistently. It's rare that we actually don't pray together at the end of the night. And even though we still only have one child left in the house, we're be beginning to develop those habits right now. And so we've had the most consistent time in the last uh, year plus um, of prayer uh, where it happens only, you know, maybe we could probably count on one hand how many times we've, we've not prayed together. This is truly an inspiring phase, this reunion. Um, for me, what I love about it as we enter this phase, or not through it by any means, is that I'm just so much more confident about sex. Like, for example, I understand my body so much better. And I could say, like, eh, I don't know, 90% of the time I like my body. <laughs> um, and I understand what um, just even how to... Um, more positive about my body and sex. And um, remember in the passion stage, I mentioned that um, I was more passive and it, and I was really thinking like, oh, this is sex is about Floyd's desire. Now I really feel that God has brought me to a place where I, I'm an equal and active partner uh, in, in the bedroom. And Floyd does encourage me to know my own desire, what makes me feel great. And um, at this point in my life, I know what I need to do to have an orgasm. Um, if I want, you know, if I want to, um, but our sex isn't defined by that. The best book that I've read, and I just read it, um, just finished it this year, it combines sexual and emotional intimacy, is a book called The Art of Intimate Marriage. And we'll make sure that you have the books that we've mentioned. We'll send those through William and Martha so that you can have them. The Art of Intimate Marriage, A Christian's Guide to Sexual Intimacy by Ted and Jennifer Conzen. It's really important, especially um, for women to read books that are specific to women about sex as well. Uh, there's a great book called The Sexually Confident Wife, Connecting 
Connecting with Your Husband, Mind, Body, and Spirit. And also a book that is, it's not Christian, so just caution with this, but it does give a lot of the science, even of our brain, uh, for women called Come As You Are. So we'll make sure that you have those things. So some of those are some of the books that have helped me. Yeah, and I want to mention a word about um, the the orgasm, because this is true for, at any stage for men. You know, when, when Tamara wouldn't have an orgasm, you know, I would go, oh my gosh, I failed as a man, not understanding that mm -hmm. uh, it's very different for women. Um, you know, uh, for a man to come to completion is, uh, is that, that's just very, very normal. Women actually can find a lot of satisfaction in just the intimacy alone. But we still needed to have those really great discussions about how to um, help each other sort of have the, the best um, pleasure response um, in sex. And so that's great. So I'm going to share my screen again. The next uh, stage that we want to talk about is a stage that can actually happen at any point in your marriage. And that's the explosion stage. <clears throat> and what's that? I don't have a passage from Song of Psalms for this, but it, it's when you experience loss. You can lose mm. your job major health challenges can um, present themselves. You can move to a new city, new relationships. You can experience financial troubles, illness, uh, or even the death of a parent. Mm. Uh, in the explosion stage, either you or your spouse or both of you are dealing with major life-shaking events that could affect your relationship day to day um, for a year, for really, in some cases, the rest of your life, depending on what the explosion is. Uh, while other stages tend to occur in order, again, the explosion stage can happen at any time in a marriage, um, though it happens mostly as we pass through our 40s and 50s and our lives become fuller. And so you're confronted by personal crisis and your marriage can be a source of solace, a place of peace, um, or it can be the place where you're, you, you feel challenged um, and, you know, by the unexpected pressure of new roles and new things that you need to do, new limitations or even new fears. You know, we've had several explosions in our 23 years together. <laughs> now, back in 2005, Tamara's father died suddenly and uh, we had to fly to South Africa to Pretoria um, to bury her father. Um, Tamara uh, came out of the full-time paid ministry in 2003 and that changed our dynamic of how we worked together and we had to work through that. Um, I came out of the full-time ministry and we had to talk about that and work through that um, in between our two sons, um, Riley, who's the oldest, and Miles, who's the youngest. We had four miscarriages and we had to talk about how we needed to come together during that explosive, those explosive moments in our lives. Our youngest son had emergency surgery when he was only nine days old as a, as a child. We had to deal with the traumas from our past. We both have had um, upbringings that have left scars on us at various, you know, in various ways. And it's come out in our marriage and we've had to learn how to work together to overcome that. We've had multiple res ministry responsibilities locally, nationally, and even internationally. <laughs> and, and then we had a teenager in the house, which... <laughs> And a teenager is very disruptive at times. <laughs> and so, and then there's COVID-19. Uh, so this is unexpected for all of us. And I've done some research about COVID-19 and in terms of what's happening here in the United States, I don't know what's happening in South Africa, but there's just mixed reviews as to whether or not um, marriages are getting stronger or mm -hmm. there are going to be more divorces during COVID-19. Uh, because some people in COVID are realizing that I don't really like living with you now that I'm with you all the time. Mm -hmm. Whereas other people are learning that, no, I really enjoy our time together. And, and so anyway, um, what's universally true is that during COVID marriages are under stress and, and some, you know, have lost employment and there's financial stress. Uh, parents here have become teachers and that's mm -hmm. not your, that's not your gift that produces stress. And of course, just the stress of infection alone um, is harder on some people than on other people. And so all of this can have a profound effect on your sex life. Yes, I just remember the first uh, night that um, midweek service was canceled because we were sheltering in place. 
Floyd and I talked for about five hours, you know, just dealing with things that we hadn't talked about. So I can definitely see how in this explosion phase or season, whenever it occurs, it, um, it just uh, forces us, it puts a lot of pressure and forces us to deal with things maybe that we hadn't dealt with before. I know some of the ingredients um, that when we are under stress, we just, what I've learned is this, we really need to pay attention to each other and stay emotionally in tune, praying together every day, show lots of affection uh, toward each other, and um, just show a lot of appreciation as well. Okay, excellent. So the last phase that we want to talk about is what we call the completion stage. Um, the completion stage. I'm going to share um, my window again here. Um, completion. And, you know, uh, Song of Songs 8 verse 7. Many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot sweep it away. Now this verse speaks of a love that is eternal. Mm -hmm. it, out, it outlasts everything. You know, there's no marriage in heaven, but our marriage still leaves a legacy that outlasts us. True. We can choose today whether our marriage will leave a legacy of love or something else. Mm -hmm. I wanna show uh, one more video. Let me stop sharing. I'm gonna show one more little clip from um, this, these sets of videos that we've been sharing here. All right, where? Are we here? All right, hold on one moment, folks. Everything is in love in Africa, starting from birth, starting, you know, being a teenager elder, even when you pass away, it's love. If I take like a Ghana, one of the country, I can take an example about funeral. It's amazing how many days it takes to get the body ready. That person is gone, but you see the love and the connection there and uh, all of these colors, you know, and the the, seeing that body going underground, six feet under, and it's so much love, so much passion. And uh, elders never forgotten, you know, they are there, they are part of our, our, the young generation life. They are, you know, everything, and it's love. I can keep going. Love is not just tongue in the mouth. To me, it's deeper than that, you know? So tongue in the mouth is one part of love to me. So it depends how you see it. Okay. All right. So we're gonna bring it in for a landing here. You know, this man is describing funerals in Ghana, and it's about love, he says, not just tongue in the mouth. It's about, it's deeper than that. Tongue in the love, tongue in the mouth is part of love, but it's not the only dimension of love. So in this completion stage, obviously we're not there yet, um, but there's lots of surveys that find that Marital happiness soars after several decades of a shared life together. You know, experts simply say simply it's because the kids are grown, couples know each other very, very well, but there's more to it than that. You know, knowing each other isn't merely about tolerating your habits, <clears throat> your quirks, or, or and your needs. Um, knowing each other has a deeper meaning and has a bigger payoff um, as well. For us, that bigger payoff is helping each other get to heaven. Mm -hmm. In heaven, you won't be married or be uh, in given marriage, but you can imagine when you see your spouse, the joy, the gratitude, the feelings, and the words cannot describe mm. what will overcome us when we realize the gift that God has given us um, in our partners in our life. We'll be able to look at each other, even though we won't be married in heaven, and go, thank you. Mm -hmm. You helped me get here. 
And I, I believe every couple on this call, you want that. Mm -hmm. you, you want to build a life that when you get to heaven, you can be filled with such gratitude about the spouse that God gave you. We are finished with our main presentation and uh, we wanna move into some questions and answers uh, that um, um, you guys gave to us ahead of time. Um, and uh, let me share my screen again because we actually have the questions on uh, slides um, and we'll just move through that. And, and so if you have any other questions, you can feel free to uh, share them in the chat. Um, and uh, William and Martha uh, will write them down. All right, Question, uh, no, questions regarding the act of sex. Uh, again, we're not marriage experts, but we'll do our best mm -hmm. uh, to be able to answer these questions. Question number one is, is sexual stimulation important for both men and women? <clears throat> the answer is yes, uh, but again, it varies. Um, definitely uh, for a man, a man, the, the way that I describe um, sexual stimulation is um, um, a man is more like a quick burner and a woman can, uh, takes a little bit more time to heat up, um, but it is still as important to be able to figure out what really helps each other. Yes, I think there's sometimes a myth that I think uh, perhaps that women don't need as much or maybe um, that the focus is on men, but women need uh, sexual stimulation to prepare, uh, especially to have orgasm. Um, and there, this is where I would definitely refer to some specific books that give instructions. You have to know anatomy, you have to know your body, how it works, especially as a woman, because our organs are hidden inside of our body. And we also need to know how important it is to focus our minds on sexual pleasure. Okay. Um, so uh, another question related to this is how can we keep foreplay exciting and not stale? Again, this is where communication is absolutely key. Um, we, um, in our bedroom and even in our office here, we have many books um, about sex and marriage. Um, and some of them have to do with sexual positions, mm -hmm. uh, just illustrations of different ways to be able to try to have sex. And we've used those. Uh, there, we have we've bought things that um, uh, that are more like you every single day. Um, it has on the sheet something new to try sexually, um, or or to build intimacy in mm -hmm. your marriage. And so we've tried that. We've tried lotions, oils, all different kinds of things. Um, but again, the key is communication. We've even gone to the bookstore together to look at some of these books and read these books together as a couple. Yeah, I know there's also, uh, there were a few questions about sexual toys and introducing those. And this is something that can't be prescribed, right? We can't say do this or don't do this. Um, I think it really depends on your conscience. I did see um, a question or a thought that came in about the origin of sexual toys, that whether there was, um, because it's such a worldly, they come from such a worldly place, is there really a place for that in a Christian marriage? And it reminds me of, um, in the United States, there's the celebration of Halloween <coughs> on October 31st, so people dress up, and sometimes they dress up as ghosts or whatever. And so I think it, these become matters of conscience, disputable matters, because if you ask 20 Christians, 10 of them would say like, oh, it's fine. And 10 of them would say, no, it's not. And both sets would have scriptures to show. So I would say about those things that um, if, if according to your conscience before God, you feel like, no, I cannot in good conscience uh, honor God in this way, then definitely do not use sexual toys. But for some people, um, that issue of conscience is not there. They can find just equal support um, from the scriptures and within their own conscience and that, that, that it's fine. But the main thing is that um, both have to agree. If one of you is uncomfortable, then it should not be brought into the marriage. Um, hopefully that helps. That's just a brief explanation. Obviously there's a longer conversation that could be had. All right, excellent. So question number two, how can I manage expectations of my spouse not reaching climax every time without feeling that I've failed him or her? Again, communication is key, but in our communication, 
I just needed to understand how Tamara felt about having an orgasm or not having an orgasm. And it was shocking to me, but it was also very useful information when she said, I don't need to have an orgasm every single time. And I didn't believe that at first. And so we ended up talking about it a few times. And, and, and when she didn't, and she was still happy and satisfied with cuddling, and I thought, okay, great. And so, but again, I wouldn't know that unless I actually talked about it and talked it through with her. Sometimes we can suffer alone thinking that there are things, thinking, trying to figure out what our spouse is thinking about these things instead of just engaging in a conversation about them. Yes, and remember the goal of, of sex or sexual of sex is is not orgasm really as much it is intimacy. It is that deeper knowing and revealing of one another. So that changes the pressure that we feel on each other. That it still can be successful and great intimacy even without orgasm. And question number three: Are there other options for physical intimacy besides sexual intercourse? Absolutely. The only thing that I that I that I don't know is if by the word physical intimacy do you actually mean sex or just mean being being close? Um, there are times in, in terms of just non-sexual intimacy where we will just cuddle together, we will just hold each other in bed or watch a movie together and cuddle, um, or we make it a point to hold hands. Um, one of the cool things that we try to do with each other is reach for each other's hands we're out in public. We know that that's not a very African thing to do, but for us, we wanted to just, it helps us just to be able to maintain a physical connection that has nothing to do with sex. And so if we're talking about um, physical intimacy as sex, um, then certainly, yeah, you can have oral sex, you can use your hands in various and creative ways. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can do. All right, let's move on to the next question. Frequency. How often uh, would be good for married couples to have sex? Um, that is entirely up to the married couple. Now, some people say at least once a week. You know, there are studies when they do these studies, um, um, sociology studies. There are some people say as long as a couple is having sex once a month, I would not like that at all. <laughs> but again, it's important for each couple to figure out what their frequency should be. And so the way that you determine that is, is which has the greater desire. And so earlier in our marriage, without question, I had the greater desire and I wanted to have sex about four or five times a week. And Tamara has been pretty consistent. She's maintained probably two or three times a week. Mm -hmm. And so, but what she's done is she's been willing to submit to my greater need. Um, and, and at times we've had uh, sex five or six times, I'm sorry, four or five times a week. Um, now we're a little bit older and my, my desire, my libido has gone down. And so I don't, I'm, I'm actually more in line with where she is and I'm good with having sex two or three times a week. Sometimes we only have sex once a week and it doesn't affect me emotionally. I still feel connected to her. And, and some of it is we have good habits of connection outside of that. So there is no set answer. Uh, again, communication is going to be key. Um, but Ephesians 5, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, is going to be the key thing that, that guides how you land on the right thing. Now, some people say, well, I don't want to just lay there. But no, no, you're still loving your husband or loving your wife uh, by giving to them. Um, submission is a form of love. Yeah. Okay. okay. Is it okay to have long breaks between having sex? Usually no, <laughs> um, but sometimes you have to, meaning your wife just had a child. For six weeks, you cannot have sex or at least cannot have inter intercourse. And then they choose to do other things. Um, there are times you might choose in the in the way of um i forget the passage i think it's hebrews where you may choose to um um, um not come together so that you can pray first corinthians 7 first, yeah. first corinthians 7 so that you can pray um but that is not an extended period of time that is a period of days or weeks at most and so usually it's not a good idea to have long breaks because again when we go back to Genesis, this one flesh is something that is an expectation from God, and it's a part of the marriage relationship. Mm -hmm. That's good. 
All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Physical affection. Is physical affection outside of sex necessary? <laughs> well, in our relationship, absolutely. Um, it is absolutely necessary. Um, as we've talked about, we've had conversations about um, um, touching each other in non-sexual ways. And my love language, if you ever read the Five Love Languages book, is phys- one of them is physical touch. And I like to be touched. And um, I like to be touched, you know, in a non-sexual way. Now, if the touching leads to sex, that's okay. But what this is talking about is this idea of learning to be in the same space and show affection for one another. And so um, there are times when I will go into the kitchen and Tamara's cooking and I will come behind her and just kiss her on the cheek and just let her know that I love her and just walk out of the room. Um, there are times, you know, uh, when she's sitting on our back porch reading her Bible and I'll just whisper in her ear, uh, I think you're beautiful and mm-hmm. then walk away. Mm-hmm. Th- there's, there's nothing more awesome than when, when you know that someone wants to be with you and it's not just about sex. You know, our youngest son He's a fairly affectionate, has been affectionate most of his life. And there are times when he comes, he used to come into our, in my bed when I would watch TV. He would come into our bedroom and he would sit next to me. And I would go, okay, well, what do you need, son? And he would say, I just want to be with you. And it would, it would just melt my heart every single time. There's something powerful about communicating that I want to be with you and it's more than just sex. Yeah, I think couples shouldn't feel pressure to be affectionate a certain way. I think in each relationship, we need to figure out how do we communicate that I am with you? Is it leaning in, you know, when we're listening to um, or or you're at worship together, leaning into each other's shoulder? Mm -hmm. Is it holding hands? Is it kissing? Is it um, rubbing each other's back? Each couple gets to decide. There's so many options. And that's the fun part. You get to decide what's meaningful for the two of you. All right. Next, communication. How do we communicate our needs as spouses to each other? Um. You, you talk. <laughs> um, you have to train yourself to be able to talk about things to go beyond your comfort zone. Now, there are lots of books that you can, um, not so much specifically books about how to talk about sex, but just in terms of learning how to talk in general is going to be a key thing. And so the other thing that actually helps is actually having another couple in your life that you can um, talk to these things uh, about. Because what ends up happening is that when you're with other people, you can learn language to use to take back into your relationship with your spouse. And so we're big advocates of mentors in marriage um, because mentors often, you know, they're down farther down the road than you and they've learned these things already. They've learned how to say these things or how to bring these topics up. And so I think discipleship and even in terms of your sexual relationship is still is crucial in this, in this, in this, this point. And then uh, what do we do if one of us takes an argument to bed? We've definitely been there. It's really hard <laughs> to, when that happens and, you know, the bed in the bedroom feels like ice, you know, it's really cold in there because we're, one of us is not um, resolved. Um, you know, again, there's nothing talking. You have to communicate. Maybe that's not the time to resolve the argument um, because it's too late. And sometimes it's not good to discuss those things late at night. Sometimes, um, you do need to talk before having sex in order to have closeness. Sometimes you, sometimes what I found too, is having sex actually opens up talking, uh, better conversation. Um, and so really there's so many things that we feel and we think, and we don't say to each other as husband and wife. And some of these, uh, things get resolved when we can just break the ice and take that risk to reveal what's underneath that knowing that yada. All right, fantastic. Moving right along, priorities. What can we do when we have fallen into the habit of prioritizing other family responsibilities over sexual intimacy? Again, 
um, the solution to this begins with having a good conversation about this. And so we've had these kinds of talks at various points in our time. Um, and, and sometimes at the very beginning when we're learning how to do this, I wouldn't communicate very well because I would just be mad mm -hmm. because I would feel like Tamara was prioritizing the kids or her friends over me. And I've learned now just to begin that conversation just by saying things like, I miss you. Um, what do you mean you miss me? I'm, I'm here. I know you're here, but I just I feel like I, I want to be connected to you. That has nothing to do with um, um, sex per se, but just who you are as a person. And so um, learning the language to begin those kinds of conversations um, is key. And then we've also tried to communicate with our kids in particular uh, the need for us to be able to have time together. Our, our sons know that we have daytime and we have time together. It's very normal for them. So they don't try to invade and all of that. They give us our space um, so that we can stay connected as a couple. Also, I, this is a practical thing. You might need to schedule <laughs> schedule it in like you would a dentist <laughs> appointment. <laughs> it will be much better than a dentist appointment. <laughs> all right. So the next uh, and the final category is health issues, aging, and libido. How does menopause and andropause affect physical intimacy? Well, uh, I think I'll, I'll tomorrow share more on this. Um, interestingly, um, my libido has gone down as I've gotten older, but we still have really, really great sex. We just have to talk about it. Um, there have been times when Tamara experiences being cold, being hot, because she's in that state. And again, we just talk and it just means, are the fans on when we're having sex? Are the, do we have sheets or not? Have, are we on top of the sheets, underneath the sheets? It, 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 it's just having communication. We laugh a little bit about it. And tomorrow laughs about it. So it's, and you know, we have a good dynamic when it comes to having that conversation. Yeah, as you could uh, imagine, it, of course it affects us. It affects your sex drive in particular, um, your comfort level. And so hopefully the things that we've shared just help you to see that you, there's always an adjustment to be made. There's not, you don't just get to this place where it's perfect and then you're supposed to coast from there. Things are constantly changing and that is totally normal. And the next question, uh, physical intimacy being maintained with health issues. This is, you know, something that is really beyond the scope of what we can talk about. Um, you now Floyd, you know, we have had experiences with some of these things um, that were mentioned here, uh, pre-diabetes or high blood pressure. However, I mean, the best thing is just to see your physician, see your doctor, just get medical advice, first of all, um, before proceeding. And then you can put into practice some of the things that we mentioned before in terms of communicating and just being gracious with yourself, showing appreciation. Celibacy is an option in marriage, especially in old age. Well, we are just, I'm 50 and Floyd is 53. So we can't speak to what happens later. We just know from other couples that they still have thriving sex lives in their 70s and 80s. Um, and um, I suppose if there is an illness that makes sense, obviously there may be a time when, the sec when sex comes to an end because of certain types of illnesses that prevent sex from happening or so you know your spouse is very ill maybe alzheimer's or other illnesses and of course maybe towards the very ends of our lives maybe that won't be a feature but um, as long as you're physically able uh, we don't see any reason why not to continue um, to have an, an active sex life as long as you're physically medically able to do it mentally able to do it okay so what do we do when one spouse seems to have lost all interest in sex and the other one still has a strong desire for it? Again, the solution to this begins with talking. Um, it seems you've lost interest in sex. Is this true? <laughs> and so begin that conversation um, with your spouse. Now, um, sometimes we, there's, we, we may, again, lose our desire for all different kinds of reasons. We feel stress. Uh, we have this, there are internal things that we're working with, but only being able to have a conversation with it will help us to be able to move forward in any kind of meaningful way. Now, again, there is this idea of learning to submit to one another. Um, if someone still has uh, a desire for sex and the other one does not, the loving thing to do is still be able to meet that person's need um, w without question. 
and then and now, now that helps when that person is also letting the other person know that I value you more than just for sex, that I appreciate you for more than just about sex. So that really sets the stage for those things to happen. Of course, again, unless there's something physiologically um, that is preventing um, one uh, spouse or another from being able to have sex, sometimes that, that, sometimes that does happen. Yeah, I was thinking about that, that there's so many things that put our brakes and it could be loss, it could be trauma, it could be the indicator that there are some other things that need to be addressed emotionally that could really strengthen your marriage and bring bring you together in a powerful way. And, and some people just have low, really low sex drives. And in that case, I, like Floyd was saying, I think about 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind. And it goes on to say, love is not self-seeking. It's not just about my sexual desire. It is a really about pleasing each other. And so there are things that I'm willing to do for Floyd that I may be like, nah, I don't really care for that, but it's not against my conscience. And in order to love him, I'm willing to do it. Um, but I also need to understand maybe sex in a certain way is not really pleasing to me, but maybe there's other things that I really like. And to be able to be things on the table and think about those things. Um, I know a friend of mine who she pretty much doesn't care for intercourse with penetration, but she loves oral sex. So, you know, um, maybe that's it. Maybe you don't really care for intercourse in the, the traditional way. Maybe oral sex is really the only way that you would like to have it. So there's just a lot of options to explore. All right. So those are the questions that we got um, from in advance. There was one that came up in the chat um, regarding whether or not I can read um, erotic novels. Um, now, the question is, is why would you want to read an, an erotic novels? But here is a passage that I think should guide you. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And so the answer I would give if I was counseling someone is no, I don't think you should read an erotic novels because um, they have to do with the, the greatest relationship, intimate relationship that God has created. Um, it has to do, it, 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 it sort of, it's corrupted in a, a erotic novel and you're bringing other people into your marriage in a very intimate way. The other thing I would say is um, even though it's not visual like pornography, uh, these kinds of books do change the way that you view sex and, so, and often in an unhealthy way. Sometimes you can come into the sexual relationship with your spouse with unrealistic expectations based on what the erotic, erotic novels are actually teaching you. And, and instead of just having a great conversation and being grateful for the spouse that you have, we can have this idealized view of it. And we start to look at our spouse in a different way and we experience disappointment. And that can actually contribute to our marriages um, just feeling like a place where we're just not being fulfilled. Did you want to add anything else to that? Yeah, erotic novels or stories, even through the movies, it's not real life. I mean, not, there will never be a movie or a novel that is has characters going through the things that we just shared about today and putting in the work because it's not entertaining to watch that and someone else. It is really only entertaining when you do it yourself and you see the reward for it, but you will never see a novel or a book about this, you know, or if you do, the, probably the couple will end up in divorce or something because it will be too hard. Yeah. The things that we're talking about require hard work, dedication, commitment. They're not the stuff of novels and movies, but it is definitely the stuff of God. This is God's work and it, the reward is incredible and you will not regret it. Absolutely. Well, that, that is our time. Um, I want to turn things back on, on over to William and Martha. Thank you once again, mm -hmm. um, brothers and sisters. We're so grateful um, that um, you allowed us to be able to share some of these things. And hopefully you found something useful. Um, I'm going to share my screen one more time. And you could take a screenshot um, of this um, if you'd like. Um, but here's what you can do moving forward is you can discuss what season you're in together. And uh, what ingredients do you need the most right now in your marriage? Um, or just get advice and open up about your marriage with other people. Um, number three is you can plan 
uh, make a plan to build your love story together, whatever season that you're in. Um, you're building something together. Remember that. You're not just living this out. You're, you're building something. And then lastly, have great sex, even tonight, if you possibly can. <laughs> and so, again, thanks for your time, everybody. Amen. Um, Amen. So I, I, I'm going to hand it over to, thank you so much, uh, Floyd and Tamara. Thank you. Uh, let me hand over to um, Fundo uh, for closing remarks. Yes. Amen. Thank you so much, Floyd and Tamara, for giving us this time uh, to share uh, your hearts, your experiences, God's word around this topic is such an exciting topic. And I know for us, we, we, we love this topic. It's not a struggle for us to talk about it and practicing it. And uh, what I really appreciate as well that uh, you shared, Tamara, is more of learning more to be like Christ at all mm -hmm. times and uh, to focus on what pleases uh, my husband. So it's, it's, it's one thing that I feel like I really need to grow more to it. And also sharing about the books that uh, as a woman that you are reading, I know I've, yeah, I've been at fault for, I've read for yeah. quite some time about books that are more about me as a woman, as a wife. So yeah, as much as I have some, but I really need to search for more that will be more inspiring and to that will mean a lot to me right now. And also, yeah, I, I was very encouraged as well about the explosion stage where uh, you shared about uh, to learn to pay attention and also uh, appreciate one another. I know I've experienced, though I was not aware what my husband was doing, he has played that role in me as I lost my husband, my, my parents in different times, yeah, in our marriage. So I've seen this, I've experienced it. It's quite interesting and comforting as well during this explosion time when mm. one is experiencing mm. it. Thank you so, so much. We really appreciate you guys. Yes, and thank you so much, guys. I know that you have put uh, much work on this. You are quite busy with the youth cop camp and then there was just a lot that was happening in your lives and then uh, but you made time to be with us uh, here in johannesburg i uh, just want to say to you and then it's a couple of churches mm -hmm. that have joined to be in this uh, zoom uh, 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 workshop which is we've got pretoria church or Tswana church of christ uh, Botswana church we have umtata church we also have Lusutu Church. We have Zambia that has joined. We have uh, the Soweto region that has joined, the East region that has joined. So we've got a couple of, it's all, all, almost over eight uh, uh, churches that have actually joined this uh, Zoom meeting just to hear more about this sacred union of uh, intimacy. So this really uh, concludes our series on intimacy. We started with spiritual intimacy and then uh, we did the emotional and this is a closing part, which is uh, uh, in, uh, the intimacy part of it. Thank you so much. And uh, really for making time, we want to say a big shout out to William and Martha. They have really done a, an outstanding job in a really searching good speakers for us who are really feeding us and then uh, in our marriages. Thank you so much to the Chiruas and uh, for such a great work. And also to the marriage ministry of Central as a whole. We want to say thank you so much, guys. And then we learned the new words that in Hebrew, actually, sex is the other. And uh, as, as one of your church ministers, so we really want to give you permission and then uh, this afternoon to go and do yada yada. So um, really, thank you so much. Really, really, thank you so much. We are short of words for what you have really done for us. Thank you so much. And uh, right now, uh, I saw Tombo has left and then uh, actually is the brother uh, that we're going to ask to close uh, really with a prayer. But I also want to announce that the coming 
devotional uh, that is coming is on the 28th of August, and uh, the Devo will be on, di on discipline of rest, on discipline of rest as we build memories together as married couples. So that's the 28th of August. Please, you can join us if you have time for that. <laughs> Amen. So I think at this point in time, I will ask uh, Brother Pakis Lebza from the East to close with a word of prayer because I see Twambo has left us. Amen. Um, Nabonto, can I uh, interject very, very quickly? We will uh, send the slides and, um, and, and the notes to William and Martha. And so uh, that will also include a list of all the books that we referenced, okay? Amen, amen. Thank you. Great stuff. And the recording and then will come out soon, the latest, that will be Wednesday, and then so that you can be able to watch it at your own time. Amen. So we'll ask Brother Pakis from the East Region to really close the gathering with a prayer. William, um, uh, is there nothing? Okay. Something? Yeah, something? No, I, uh, no, I think to... we covered everything. Uh, Pakis can uh, close for us with a word of prayer. Perfect. Yes. Amen. Amen. Uh, let us pray. Uh, Father God, Lord, Father, we thank you so much for your grace, Father, for your mercy, and Father, for your love. Holy God, we thank you for marriage, Father, that marriage is sacred. Father, and you created us, Father God, to be one flesh. Holy God, it was truly and encouraging Father God to learn, Father God, about the various seasons that we can go through. But ultimately, Father God, we ought to give you all the glory, Father God. And thank you so, so much for blessing us, Father God, with amazing relationships, Father. Marriage is so unique, Father, and it is through you, by you, with you, that we can make it work. Father, I am father uh, excited and in looking forward father god to father god deep meaningful interaction father god talking about where we are at because I, I think every other question that was asked the answer was clear and basic that we need to communicate father i pray lord that we will be vulnerable with one another we will be vulnerable in our marriages father with our spouses so that father we can see each other we can see one another inside out father where we can learn what it means to be transparent to be honest to be father god to see each other in a way that you see us thank you so much for sex father that lord you blessed us with an opportunity to unite and take each other in a level where father god only me and my spouse me and my wife can know more about one another in this way thank you whole lord father that um we can now learn to engage um and talk about this father god in a deep meaningful way father god thank you for the lesson i pray that i know that many people were coming in and going and father there is a lot of challenge when it comes to sex uh, purely from where we come from how we were raised and then even us now as uh, uh, adults father god how we have interacted with sex father but i pray that you will take us on a journey where our minds will be pure we will be cleansed we will be transformed we will be renewed holy god so that our marriages can exude what you want to see father god because ultimately it is to your glory thank you so so much father god for the speakers i appreciate just them being able to take us through their own life's journey through them sharing about the phases that they have been through and father what we take away from there is father we need to communicate and we must enjoy ourselves father god Thank you that, Lord, we have this such an amazing opportunity as merits that we can talk and truly see one another from this fashion. 
thank you for today. I, I, I thank you for your love. Father, I thank you that you are there with us consistently. So it is in your son's name that we always pray. Amen. 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 Well, thank you so much, guys. Thank Let's you. have a great time of afternoon. And then thank you so much, uh, Floyd and, and Tama. So enjoy your day. Thank you so much. We'll connect thank later, you. the three of us. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for connecting. We really appreciate right. that. Thank you. Great to Such be with you guys. an honor to be with you guys. Yes, absolutely. And, and then yeah. thanks, everybody. Thank you.